Hey guys, today we're going to talk about the Big Bang Theory. Not the television show, the model of the universe that mainstream science tells us this is what the universe is. Now I think most people don't know that there really is only two pieces of evidence that is used to prop up this theory and it relies heavily on major if assumption. And I want to talk about these two pieces of evidence and I want to question our ability to say with confidence where this universe came from, number one, and how old it is, number two. And then I'll try and make a case of why this actually matters. And we can take the first piece of evidence from the cartoon version of science itself that they give to us. Up to the middle of the 20th century, most scientists thought of the universe as infinite and ageless. Now you won't believe what the mainstream science tells us that changed everybody's mind. It's coming up here in the 1960s. Until Einstein's theory of relativity gave us a better understanding of gravity. And by the way, Einstein does not have to be wrong about relativity or anything for the whole theory of the Big Bang to be wrong on its own. And Edwin Hubble discovered that galaxies are moving apart from one another in a way that fits previous predictions. So right here we've been introduced to the first theory, the first if then because. This is a conditional proposition or a hypothesis. They said that Hubble discovered that galaxies were moving apart from each other. I want you to think of this statement. This man was here on Earth with a telescope at best and he discovered that galaxies were moving away from each other. This is based on lights in the sky, it's not based on direct observations, so there is a heck of a lot of assumptions going on here. In 1964, by accident, cosmic background radiation was discovered, a relic of the early universe. And that right there is actually the second theory, second part of the theory, so we're going to go through both of these. Now these are quite enormous words being used in this cartoon depiction, but unfortunately this cartoon depiction is exactly what you see in university lectures. I think uh, my favorite person for giving this information in English is Lawrence Krauss, and he says exactly this. And Einstein had just developed his general theory of relativity in 1916, which was the first theory of not just how objects move through space, but how space itself could expand and contract and be dynamical. A remarkable theory that told us that space curves in the presence of matter. And it was beautiful, and he kind of knew it was correct. Einstein told us that space could curve. He told us, and this is the truth as it's presented, and he just knew it was true, of course, even though he never went to space and none of these experiments were ever conducted in space. None of these theories are based on anything we actually have observed in space. But at the time, it disagreed with observation which used to bother physicists in the old days. And uh, the... Um, yeah, it doesn't matter if our theory of the universe disagrees with observation. And the observation was that the universe was static and eternal. Static means not moving. So they assumed the Earth was not moving. Why did they assume this? Partially because the star patterns appear in the same way every single night over eons. Yet the cartoon, modern, mainstream science that is the truth, they show us that the Earth is wobbling all around, so we must be wrong. And his theory didn't agree with that, because his theory of general relativity suffered from the same problems that gra Newtonian gravity suffers from. Gravity sucks. It always pulls. It never pushes. And if you put stars and galaxies out there, they will not just stay there. Gravity will produce a universal attraction that will pull them together. I bet people mostly don't know that they had to really kind of invent this whole theory of the Big Bang to even make Newtonian or Einstein's physics make sense into what they are saying the universe is. They cannot find a theory that fits their observation other than this. So their theories, Newtonian and Einstein, don't work, they're saying, without the Big Bang. He tried to figure out what to do and, and he was able to change his theory slightly, consistent with the mathematical symmetries that allowed him to develop it. Well, that's great. If the theory does not fit the observation, then you do have to change the theory. But the problem is they just made up a whole bunch of constants. They made up things like dark energy and dark matter. None of these things have been observed or accounted for. They cannot account for the vast majority of gravity in the universe that they would need to hold it together. These are huge problems. So this was the theory that didn't work, that explained the universe we didn't live in, or so he thought. And so he was able to change it a little bit by adding an extra term to the left-hand side which he called the cosmological term. This term on the left-hand side would produce a small repulsive force throughout empty space, so small that it wouldn't affect Newton's laws, which of course uh, described beautifully, or developed in fact, to describe the motion of the planets around the sun. 
And it's always been weird to me that they have to go to such lengths to try and bend this into Newtonian physics. I mean, you can obviously see this with Einstein struggling to connect it, and we're still struggling today to match it to observation. And by what I can see, all they give us is actual cartoons as proof. So by the way, the Newtonian world and the Einstein world, they assume that we are this ball here bopping around, but we have multiple observations that this is not the case and this is the observations that they saw in the ancient times because all they had was looking up at lights in the sky if the universe is really expanding which is what we now know and i'll talk to you about how we know that then you don't need a cosmological constant anymore if the universe is expanding gravity can be universally attractive and just slow the expansion and the big question of 20th century cosmology became is there enough gravity to stop the expansion? So the universe must expand to save all of our theories about the universe according to science because they cannot have a static Earth or a static universe for any reason. How will the universe end? Will it end with a bang or a whimper? Will it end with a big crunch, the reverse of the big bang, or will it expand forever? So now we're going to actually examine the evidence, but you can just see here that this is very shaky for an entire big bang theory to be built on and this there's not much more than this if you actually look into it this is what modern cosmology is based on and they are no longer concerned with proving this they take this as fact they are now only concerned with how the universe is going to end this is edwin hubble and he made uh, many discoveries but the biggest one he made of course was the discovery that the universe is in fact expanding and it changed everything uh, what he discovered was that all other galaxies are moving away from us on average but whether, whatever you say, the Big Bang happened. How Hubble came to the conclusion that galaxies were moving away from us were that some appeared red and some appeared blue, and more appeared red than blue. And so this red shift meant that if we lived in a Newtonian universe, then that red shift would mean that they were moving away from us. This is a huge assumption based on a non-observation. These are just lights in the sky. Some of them are more red than blue. This is literally what the expansion model is based off of. This one observation, light shifted towards either red or blue. They could be just lights for all we know. Unfortunately, this exact same concept, measuring light, is how they come to tell us that this certain proportion of matter makes up this galaxy or this star. They're measuring the light and they're making assumptions of the chemical makeup of these bodies, assuming that these indeed are bodies in Newtonian space. How do we know the universe is expanding? Is that when a train comes towards you, the train whistle sounds higher. When a train moves away from you, the train whistle sounds lower. And that same principle was used by Hubble and others. So when we look at distant galaxies, if they're moving away from us, the light, which is a wave, gets stretched out. The longer wavelength part of light, or the red end of the spectrum, so it's called redshifted. And galaxies are more and more redshifted the further and further they are away from us. So that's how we know their velocity. You see, I'm not making this up. Mainstream science believes the universe is expanding because some of the lights that we look at in the sky are more red and some of them are more blue. And that has to mean that it's expanding because Newton has to be correct and Einstein has to be correct. We could determine the distance to the back of the room if I turned out all the lights and only one light was on and I knew it had a 100 watt light bulb. Catch that if. If he knows how powerful the source is, then he can extrapolate the distance. That is true. If we assume that suns are stars, that are big, huge, massive bodies of light, then yes, we could assume certain things from that. But is that true? That we do not actually have evidence for. One of the many embarrassments in cosmology that's happened over the years, and in fact taken by some people to once again argue that science didn't know what it was doing. The problem was trying to measure distance because he didn't have good standard candles. And we now have standard candles. Here's, here's one. I, I wish there was better resolution on this projector. It's a beautiful picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. So we couldn't really calculate the distance because we did not have standard measurements because we could not actually observe any of these bodies, these lights in the sky, so we had to make assumptions. But now we have these candles because we have a Hubble Space Telescope apparently and it's given us the CGI. This is not a photograph, this is not a digital photograph, this is a complete CGI rendering here on Earth by the CGI operator. And these are now our standard candles. So don't worry, we have a better handle on it. Now our math makes sense. I cut out the part there where Hubble's math said that the universe was younger than the Earth. And I'm just really challenging the premise here that they're all using. They're all using the premise that we are in a Newtonian universe that must be expanding and that these lights in the sky must be bodies that 
are far away from us and so their light must tell us whether they are coming towards us or away from us and I think the premise itself is incorrect. These objects, these exploding stars, are great standard candles. We can actually observe them. We can observe stars exploding, we can measure their brightness, we can measure their colors, and that has allowed us to, to, to produce a great standard candle. And after 75 years, we now can determine the expansion rate of the universe. This is a new Hubble diagram, and we therefore, in fact, we now know the age of the universe through other things extremely accurately. Yep, we got it, guys. It's all figured out to four decimal places. Yep, it all makes sense, don't worry. It's amazing that we can say that with a straight face and have re scientific reasons to support that. It would be amazing if we did actually have scientific evidence to support that, but as we have seen, the first major pillar they're calling evidence here is literally that the lights in the sky are mostly reddish. Okay, great. Einstein had this cosmological term. He said, I was my biggest blunder. I want to throw it out. But the problem is you can't get rid of it so easily because using the miracle of modern mathematics, you can rewrite that equation. When it's here, it looks like a new contribution of the energy and momentum of the universe. What could contribute a term like this? And we know the answer, nothing. If you take empty space, and that means get rid of all the particles, all the radiation, absolutely everything. So there's nothing there. If that nothing weighs something, then it contributes a term like this. Guys, this guy is not some obscure dude. This guy is totally speaking for what the mainstream believes. This is it. All of this rests on the expanding universe. All of that is based on the redshift. All of that is meant to confirm Newton. Here, by the way, is actually a, 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 an animation that was shown at the Nobel Prize ceremony. We're up to win the Nobel Prize for, for developing the theory that produced this. This is the space inside of a proton. Now this lecture is over an hour and I've cut it down a fair bit already. I just wanted to include some of the jargon that you can see is totally just extrapolated on mathematics based on the theory of the Big Bang expanding universe. The theory produces the mathematics, which produces the CGI that we actually get to describe our universe, both on the massive scale of the universe itself and apparently inside protons and such. Testing your knowledge means everything. Uh, his name is Tycho Brahe. He, as many of you know, laid the basis for Newton's law of gravity by doing nothing other than spending 20 years on his back, in this case, looking up at the sky, without a telescope, measuring the positions of the planets around the sun. And then he was a crummy feudal lord. He got kicked off that island, gave the data to a hapless assistant named Johannes Kepler, who um, again spent 20 years without a Macintosh trying to interpret the data and fudged it, we now know, uh, and came up with, of course, Kepler's laws, which led to Newtonian gravity. And the point is, we can use gravity. This is science, ladies and gentlemen. Dude lays on his back, he calculates the planets, he gives his data to Kepler. Kepler is known to fudge the results. Newton comes up with Newtonian physics, and we're still there. And we now understand that 90% of the mass of galaxies and clusters, including our own Milky Way galaxy, is made of stuff that doesn't shine. Yep, so once again, mainstream science cannot account for the actual masses of the bodies based on their models, so they have to continue to make up things like dark matter and dark energy to fill in the gaps. And you heard it from him, 98% of the matter is unaccounted for to fit their model without these made-up constants. Okay, great. Because for reasons I don't have time to explain, we know how many protons and neutrons there are in the universe. We can actually measure that. Okay, great. And there are experiments here in South Dakota and in, uh, in, in Europe, all over the world looking for dark matter. We haven't found it yet. All over the world looking for dark matter. We haven't found it yet. The laws of physics allow a universe to begin from nothing. You don't need a deity. You have nothing, zero total energy, and quantum fluctuations can produce a universe. Okay, great. Okay guys, we've covered the first piece of evidence that they use for the theory of the Big Bang cosmology. That is the redshift observed in the lights in the sky. Now he's going to get into the second piece of evidence, which is crucial. This is the cosmic background microwave radiation. This is basically once they measure radiation in the sky, they always see a baseline of radiation. And they assume this to be the remnants of the Big Bang. And there's a heck of a lot built on this assumption as well, of course because it's the most important, probably, observation in all of cosmology. The observation of the cosmic microwave background radiation, the afterglow of the Big Bang. One of the many reasons we know the Big Bang actually happened. Actually, we're over halfway through this lecture and there's only been one 
reason supposedly presented, which is the redshift, and this is now the second reason. And this is actually the only other, what they call, evidence for the Big Bang, which everything else is based on. Well, we can't see all the way to the Big Bang, because between us and the Big Bang, there's a wall. And that means I can see all the way back to that radiation coming at that surface. A prediction of the Big Bang is there should be radiation coming at me from all directions. And it was the radiation that was discovered by accident by two people who didn't know what the hell they were doing. And they won the Nobel Prize anyway. You've all seen this radiation. Remember when the TV stations used to end and then there'd be static? 1% of the static on your TV screen is radiation from the cosmic microwave background. Now, I'm not going to include this TV static theory as any sort of evidence for the Big Bang that is complete nonsense. Yet this story, this two guys from New Jersey story accidentally discovering that they see a little bit of background radiation no matter where they look. This is literally huge evidence. This is it. There's nothing more to it than this, than this fact. And they tie this to the TVs and I think it's just gibberish. But it's amazing we didn't even know about it until 1965. In any case, as interesting as that history is, on this surface... Now the entire rest of the story is going to be extrapolated on those two points. I'm not going to put you through the rest of the lecture because it's pretty much all a fairy tale made up from these theories. And you can read Lawrence Krauss's book, you can watch the full lecture, it's fine, it's entertaining. You can read any book on space that you want. I've read a whole bunch of them. These are the only two points that I can seem to find that they actually rest their theory of the expanding universe and thus the Big Bang on. This is what they tell us our universe actually looks like based on this. Okay, great. In this hot, dense environment, energy manifested itself in particles that existed only for the tiniest glimpses of time. There are many, many combinations of quarks that can form all sorts of hadrons, pressure, stars and galaxies began to form. So, my point here is that we have a very elaborate theory of the universe built on very, very little. This is sold to us with the utmost of confidence and we are considered stupid if we do not believe this model of the universe. Well, I do not believe this model of the universe. In fact, I do not believe that mainstream science has presented any actual evidence that we have ever been to space. I do not buy CGI and Photoshop. I do want concrete evidence of observation. I don't want computer models. I do want photographs and any other concrete actual evidence that there is even bodies out there in space. Do we even live in a Newtonian world? I do not think so. I think we live in something closer to a video game. I think that's what the cosmic background microwave radiation is and I do not think we can go to space I do not think we do go to space and that would be a whole nother video but to me why this matters is because these are the foundations of our life here and if we are to have any purpose here in this world it should logically be connected to what this world actually is this is why we have the atheist world promoting this Lawrence Krauss is one of them Atheists are promoting this version of the universe, which does not include any specific purpose for us. I do believe there is a purpose to this world, I'm not sure. That doesn't necessarily matter. We could be a video game. We could just be Sims figures in a video game. We could be artificial intelligence ourselves. All of this is besides the point, but we can't really have an honest conversation about what this world is if we're accepting a model of the universe based on such flimsy pieces of evidence. And I like to keep the quotes around the word evidence for this entire presentation because I don't think this is actual evidence. These are not good pieces of evidence for any other thing that we would be talking about. They can get away with this because it's supposedly space and we can't confirm any of these things for ourselves. Well, the truth is I don't think they confirm any of this stuff either. And I think this theory is pretty much bogus because it rests on bogus. And until I see actual evidence otherwise, I'm not going to believe the Big Bang model of the universe. And for today, guys, that's all I've got. I appreciate you. Until next time. And if you want to see what is apparently my most controversial video that was banned from YouTube and BitChute, you can go to wagthedogtheory.com and view the whole uncensored version of the video. And I recommend downloading it if it is still there. And definitely check out my newest book, Fake Diseases. It covers all of the major topics that come up like birth defects, blood sugar problems, bone and joint problems, cancer, autoimmune problems, and more. And it's on Amazon for just $9.99. And the audiobook read-along version is free here on YouTube, and the link for that is in the description of this video. Mm -hmm.